Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, I want to welcome you to our sixth in the series of conversations organized by the Valkill Partnership, Open Society University Network, Bard College, and the Telwar Network. My name is Erin Kinan. I'm the Dean for Civic Engagement and the Vice President for Student Affairs at Bard College. I'm sitting about four miles away from where Eleanor Roosevelt grew up and about 20 miles from Eleanor's home, which is now a national park. Valkill, Eleanor's home, is where Eleanor found her voice. And in our series, we're looking back to that voice while we look to the future. Of Valkill, Eleanor said, Valkill is where I used to find myself and grow. At Valkill, I emerged as an individual. I'm joined today by my friend, Manuela Roosevelt, who chairs the Valkill Partnership, which is a friends group of the National Park Service that preserves Eleanor's home. It is my pleasure to serve as the secretary on the Valkill board. Our board is dedicated to lifting Eleanor's legacy. And perhaps her greatest legacy is her written work. And tomorrow is now the title of her last book. She writes, the future is literally in our hands to mold as we like, but we cannot wait until tomorrow. We must learn to cast out crippling fear. How strange it is that we all seem to be afraid of one another. Our series has featured leaders who are not waiting for tomorrow. A little bit about our sponsors. The Open Society University Network is a partnership between Bard College, Central European University, and the Open Society Network, um, developing academic programs supporting student and institutional civic engagement across geographic and demographic boundaries that includes research, network classes, academic programs, international mobility and community partnership. The Telwar Network is an international association of higher education institutions committed to strengthening the civic roles and social responsibilities of institutions that has resulted in a global movement of engaged universities. And now let me introduce Manuela. Manuela Roosevelt is the chair of the Eleanor Roosevelt Valkill Partnership, a private nonprofit that works in tandem with the National Park Service for the enhan enhancement of visitors' experience at the home of Eleanor Roosevelt. The organization funds educational programs, lectures, and has raised more than $2.5 million for the National Park Service to assist in restoration projects at the site of Eleanor's home. She is the editorial director at Callaway Arts and Entertainment, a publisher and cross-platform media company in New York City. And she lives with her family at Springwood, the estate where Franklin Roosevelt was born and now belongs to the National Park Service. I'm gonna turn the floor over to you, Manuela. Thank you, Erin. And thank you again for hosting this, this wonderful webinar for all of us. Welcome to everybody. Uh, a huge thanks to the BARD team for assisting us. And we could not be more honored to have Jennifer Jones Austin with us today. I promise you this is going to be a conversation of the heart and very, very timely for the challenging times we're all going into or barreling into, I would say. Um, as Erin explained, for, for those of you who are new to, to our webinar series, um, Tomorrow is Now is the, the title of Eleanor Roosevelt's last book. She wrote 30 books during her lifetime, and this is a manifesto for the next generation, for all of you with more tomorrows than yesterdays in your own lives, to become engaged uh, deeply and consistently to, make tomorrow, to start making tomorrow today what you want it to be. Um, she was dying when she wrote the book. She was very, very ill. Um, she was 78 and uh, she, was, she was fighting um, essentially, you know, with that part of the dying process. So um, she very much wanted to complete it and leave it to us. And what we do is we take, we take Eleanor's legacy tiring figure um, in the world of human rights. Uh, without her, we would not have the um, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is the Magna Carta for dignity and uh, one of the pillars of, of international peace. And we interpret it for, for particularly the next generation and 
Bar, um, the Open Society, Universities Network, and the Teluach Network are very much our friends in this endeavor, and all of you are, are our champions, our ambassadors uh, for Ellen Roosevelt. Today, we're so, so lucky to be here with Jennifer Jones Austin, a child and family advocate, and the Chief Executive Officer and Executive Director of the Federation of Protestant Welfare Agencies, an anti-poverty policy and advocacy organization with 170 member human services agencies operating throughout New York City. Mayor de Blasio, the mayor of New York City, appointed you as board chair in March 2020. You have served as a board member since October 2013. Prior, prior to joining the uh, FPWA, you served as Senior Vice President of the United Way of New York City, Faculty Services Coordinator for Mayor Bloomberg, Deputy Commissioner for the New York City Administration for Children's Services, Civil Rights Deputy Bureau Chief for Attorney General Eric Spitzer, and Vice President for Learn Now Edison Schools. You have chaired and served in several influential boards and commissions including serving as co-chair of New York City Mayor de Blasio's transition, chair of the New York City Procurement Policy Board, and co-chair of the New York State Supermarket Commission. You're currently a board member of the National Action Network, the New York Blood Center, the New York City Board of Corrections, and the Fund for Public Housing. So in all these extraordinary and remarkable roles, we have an individual who's totally dedicated to being present for others, particularly in a city like um, New York City, which is so diverse. It's, it's um, a microcosm of, of the world. And as such, um, thrives and, and suffers from great disparity. We have um, oh. sorry. My Zoom just <laughs> pulled it up. Um, New York City has, I believe, 48 of the world's billionaires living in, in Manhattan, but it also suffers from great poverty, something that Ellen Roosevelt recognized. Which she was already 17. She volunteered in the forest areas of the city as a, as a young teenager um, to the great shock of her family who thought she would bring home terrible illnesses and terrible things. Um, so we have somebody here who has spent a lifetime in her career, and I'm sure putting her heart and soul to, um, to dedicating her focus and attention to those people who suffer the most in the city. Jennifer, what strikes me in looking at all the very important roles you have and continue to undertake is a parallel to Eleanor Roosevelt's own life. Both you and Eleanor can be defined as activists and disruptors in the challenging and rewarding journey to bring intelligence to the world of the unseen and of the unheard. Claire Booth Lewis said of Eleanor Roosevelt, no woman has ever comforted or distressed or so distressed I could say probably the same about you. Was Eleanor Roosevelt ever an inspirational figure in your life? I first just want to thank you for gifting me this opportunity to spend time with you and with the students this morning. I'm deeply honored to be here. To Never would I have imagined that uh, my name would be spoken within the same, like, you know, within five minutes of hearing, uh, you know, Eleanor Roosevelt talked about and uh, all that she has been uh, to this nation and to the world, she continues to inspire. So has she been an inspiration to me? Most definitely, yes. Uh, I grew up with a, uh, a mother who uh, grew up in the South, a black woman who was told when she, at the age of seven, when she told her teachers that she wanted to uh, study the arts and be involved in the arts, that that was not a profession for a, a little black girl from the South. And she grew up to become the first uh, curator of a uh, African-American curator of a Fortune 500 art program. Uh, she would often talk about Eleanor Roosevelt. 
And she would say things like, you know, um, Eleanor Roosevelt talked about how no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. Uh, she would talk about, you know, that Eleanor Roosevelt would say things that you must do the, the thing that, uh, you know, you think that you cannot do. Yeah, those were the, and, and she would say, these were the words of Eleanor Roosevelt. And then she would talk about the things that she did. She would help us to appreciate that Eleanor Roosevelt, even though she may not have constantly and openly talked about race in America, she created space and opportunity for Black Americans and for Black women. I grew up hearing about Marian Anderson being denied the opportunity to speak at Washington, D.C.'s Constitutional Hall but First Lady, then First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, making it possible for her to sing, have a concert at the Lincoln Memorial. And, you know, and, and also in recent years, hearing about how she supported uh, Mary McLeod Bethune, you know, an educator, Black educator and human rights activist. So I'd heard about her and then I'd gotten to read about her. And, and I can say that, yes, she inspired me because here was this woman when Many women weren't speaking up, speaking truth to power. When, you know, when at a time when maybe women didn't occupy positions of leadership, respected by everybody, she used the positions she had to make them powerful and effective and to bring about change, not just for herself, but for so many others. So yes, she did inspire me and does inspire me. Wonderful, Jennifer. Let's let's concentrate a little bit on speaking truth to power. As we know right now in this country, speaking truth to power is dangerous. Mm -hmm. It was the same in Eleanor's own time. Uh, according to one of her biographers, Alida Black, who, who wrote uh, an introduction to Tomorrow's Now, um, Eleanor Roosevelt received 19 assassination attempts for her work in the south of the United States. Um, she, she was, these, these assassination attempts by, were by the KKK. She would travel on her own with her secretary to the south to conduct civil disobedience workshops. So civil disobedience workshops sound terribly disruptive, but it was it was a way for her to say, how can you be effective in your protesting? How can you bring your voice to, to the inequality that exists in, in, in this country and make it, make it heard? So this, this was you know, a, a, a seen as a terrible, terrible thing that she was doing and the FBI actually compiled one of the largest files of any American citizen to date, I think, um, because of this, these activities with which they regarded as terribly dangerous and anti-American. So um, today we live in a place and a time where we're challenged, where truth is questioned, all the time, every day, every hour. Do, do any of the newspapers report truthfully? Does anybody speak truthfully? Everything is doubted. And where so much information is swirling about. So could you tell us, how do you keep your compass, your moral compass, your, your straight and narrow focus on what is true? So for me, uh, so much of who I am and, and how I try to, if my children were here, they'd laugh at what I'm about to say, how I move through the world. They tell me that I'm constantly saying to people, I like how you move through the world or I like how she moves through the world. So much of how I move through the world is, has been informed by my childhood experiences and what I saw in uh, the people uh, who raised me, people I revered, uh, People, I saw people committed, dedicated to their callings, to their passions, whatever they may have been. I mentioned my mother having become an art curator after having been told early in life that that was not what she could be as a little black child. Her commitment and dedication to her passion fueled my commitment and dedication to my passion. 
seeing my father, who was a social justice leader and civil rights activist, champion, you know, causes one after the next, not always prevailing, but knowing that his belief in human rights and opportunity for everybody was a cause that he had to keep fighting for, no matter, you know, whether he was making progress or not, those individuals inspired me and others the world over. People who understand that change will not come rapidly, but nothing valuable really ever is that easily achieved. Nothing worth fighting for ever just happens or comes to you overnight. And so I think it is looking at other people and having seen how they stayed the course, no matter how difficult it was, and they embraced whatever successes they had along the way, however small they may have been, because progress is progress, sometimes large, sometimes a great, sometimes small, but progress is progress. And I think that's what keeps me going. And I've seen it in different places and spaces in my work, where I may not get everything that I'm fighting for, but I'm seeing that the door is opening just ever, you know, ever so wide. And I'm just going to keep pushing it a little wider. Good. Wonderful. Many of our students will be deeply inspired by your journey into the various roles you hold in helping others. What do you tell young people who want to start along the same footsteps? Eleanor Roosevelt famously said, the best way to begin is to begin. I how agree. Did come into, how did you come into this? line of work, what do you do? What is your day like? What is your week like? Ooh, the best way to begin is to begin. So uh, that means getting up for me at about 5 a.m. in the morning. And, uh, you know, sometimes I jump right out of bed. And sometimes I, um, you know, sometimes I'll say a prayer or two. Sometimes I'll read scripture. And sometimes I'll grab my phone, uh, which really shouldn't be on my nightstand because that's just too tempting in the middle of the night. But it is. Uh, and I will, I'll, I'll look at my calendar, see what's ahead of me for the day, and then I'll make sure that I'm mentally prepared for it. I'm very grateful for every day that I have. Uh, I've been on some journeys that made uh, the next day uh, less certain than more certain. And so I'm grateful for every day. And what I try to do is to begin the day with a sense of um, gratitude and purpose and then move accordingly. And so uh, the day for me can work-wise begin as early, usually as early as 7.30, which it did today. And it can end uh, sometimes 9.30, 10 o'clock. Uh, tonight, it's probably going to end at about nine o'clock because I have a two hour meeting that begins at seven. What I can tell you is that the day is filled with meaning and it's filled with purpose. I try not to be wasteful with the time. I try to make sure that the conversations that I have, some of them are casual, but that they're, you know, that, that, I, that I get something from them, that I pour myself into them. When Eleanor Roosevelt spoke about, you know, just, you know, like the best way to begin is to begin, I would add to that is, you know, as I just said, showing up, being present in the moment. If an opportunity is afforded you, or if you're going to avail yourself of an opportunity or make it possible for yourself, then live into it. Very often what happens is, is opportunity presents and you know, we just, it's, it's another box to check off, right? It's another thing to say that we've done, but we haven't really gotten the most out of it or we haven't contributed the most to it because we really didn't lean into it. It just happened. We're glad it happened. We get to say it happened, but did we really bring our whole selves to it? So what I try to do and what I tell people all the time is bring your all to it, lean into it. If the day is beginning, lean into it. If it's a new experience, lean into it. Don't hold back, just give yourself to it. That's right, that's right. Wholeness, wholeness is very rewarding. Eleanor Roosevelt highlighted ways of making social change in her column, My Day, encouraging ordinary individuals to have faith their own powers of becoming involved and changing inequality. Now, she was a person who had to find great resilience in, in her own self. She had a very, very difficult 
childhood. She was essentially orphaned by the age of 10, living um, up here not far from Erin, uh, with essentially a Victorian grandmother who did not believe that girls should be educated. She married well and tried to do the best with their teens and tapestries. Um, she, she, um, she suffered a lot from, from early childhood on and the, the challenging times during the presidency, starting with the Great Depression and then World War II, when her four sons uh, volunteered and, and served. And she was as fearful as every mother in the United States um, that they, they would not come back home. All of this made her um, have to deepen her well of wisdom. Can you tell us a little bit about how you deepened or have deepened your own well of wisdom? And this is something that we have not talked about in these webinars, but we all, human life is full of challenges and we cannot predict them. They come all on their own. And um, how, how do you do that? How, how do you deepen that well? How do you find yourself? So um, I mentioned that my father was a social justice leader, civil rights leader. He um, actually uh, co-founded, along with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the Progressive National Baptist Convention, which was the Black Baptist Church's um, engagement in the civil rights movement accompanying the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. My father, um, social justice leader, was also a, a minister, and he would preach about the storms of life. He would say, everybody goes through storms. You're either in a storm, coming out of one, or about to go through one. Nobody goes through life without experiencing storms. And then he would go on to talk about how it's all a matter of mind and perspective, how you approach the storms that you're, you're living through or that you may encounter. And if you approach them with a sense of readiness to engage, to embrace your circumstances, knowing that when you come through them, you will be stronger having gone through a, a, a challenging experience. You're going to be better for it. Uh, a mentor of mine, a uh, gentleman who used to be the commissioner of the child welfare system, he was the fire department commissioner. He was a deputy mayor here in New York City. Um, he grew up in foster care and people would say to him, it's amazing that you accomplished all that you did given your background, given your childhood and how challenging your childhood was. And he'd say, I'm not who I am despite my circumstances. I am who I am because of my circumstances. Those two individuals and all that they taught me by example and by their words, Help me to appreciate that when I experience challenges, there's growth that can come from them. And as you know, you and I have just briefly talked about Manuela, I experienced a life-threatening illness. I was diagnosed with leukemia in 2009. And uh, literally within two days of uh, being diagnosed, uh, something that happened just came upon me very suddenly. Within two days of being diagnosed, the doctors, uh, rendered me comatose, put me in a coma, uh, intubated me, put a tube down my throat because the cancer was in my lungs and I could no longer breathe on my own. And they told my husband that I was going to die in 48 hours. Literally within four days of being diagnosed, I was, by the doctor's expectations, going to die. And clearly I survived that, but uh, it was this long, arduous journey uh, to, you know, to get to a place of good health once again. I needed a bone marrow transplant. I had round after round of chemo and radiation, needed a transplant, couldn't find a donor. Ultimately, I received a cord blood transplant and I survived. Uh, it's now been better than 10 years. What I learned from that journey was that there was, there was reason for my suffering. Because in my suffering, while needing a transplant, I learned that people of African descent have a very difficult time finding a donor for a bone marrow transplant. So my family launched a nationwide search to find a donor. And it was the largest search that ever occurred. Better than 13,000 people joined the registry 
And while I didn't get a transplant from any one of those persons, to date, better than 100 people across the country have received bone marrow transplants, life-saving treatment from people who came forward for me. The point of all of this is that what I learned is that my suffering had a purpose that was greater than me. We were able to use that journey and that experience to raise awareness about bone marrow, you know, about leukemia and other blood disorders, and about the need for people of African descent to join the bone marrow registry. We learned the significance of community taking care of community and how your challenges can invigorate you and others to step up and do more. And so that's where I'm now finding at every turn resilience. As I've moved through COVID, I've been psychologically in some ways maybe less challenged than, than members of my family or friends or colleagues because I know what it's like to have had uncertainty about tomorrow and whether I would live another day or another month. And that has caused me to embrace this moment and try to figure out what can we do in this moment that makes the world better for tomorrow, just as we did when I had leukemia. Jennifer, thank you so much. I am personally very moved that you could share the story. I think our students are moved as well. And let's, let's all take a moment in thinking that the greatest challenges are actually the greatest openings in our own private lives, but also the greatest openings for others. And, and yes, we, we are, sometimes we feel we are in a perpetual storm and we may well be, uh, particularly those of you who are young, you have no idea what climate change and what the political situation will, will bring tomorrow. And it's um, up to you to, to change it. So let's, let's all reflect on this great human and spiritual and soulful, soulful truth that the greatest and deepest suffering is actually the greatest teaching that we can receive and share with one another. And when we do share it, the lives of others are also elevated as well as our own. And if it's life-threatening, if it's risking your life, sometimes that is a teaching in itself. And um, sometimes life is a razor's edge. And again, we haven't spoken about these aspects of life. Uh, they were true for Eleanor, they're true for Ed, Jennifer. They're twin souls in that way. Um, and Jennifer is, is being extraordinarily generous in telling us these things. Um, I'm going to change pace a little bit. Um, I'm going to talk about the, the third chapter in Eleanor's book is titled Revolution. She explained that during her lifetime, revolutions took place on every continent and in every way, political, economic, ideological. Jennifer, we feel we're in the middle of a revolution, right? At some point we'll come out. Um, the students who are listening are going to be the leaders of tomorrow. Um, what collective actions are needed right now for this revolution? So um, the revolution that we're in right now, as, as, I, um, as, I, as, I, as I think about it, is we are, uh, in the midst of a public health crisis that has brought about an economic crisis uh, that has been um, complicated or complemented, if you will, by a um, reinvigorated, uh, refueled racial crisis. Uh, we also have a significant leadership crisis in trying to deal with all of this. I don't think it's happenstance that we are going through COVID and we're seeing how COVID uh, is impacting all of us uh, with those who are, um, those of us who are uh, the lowest income, uh, those, who, uh, those of us who are of color suffering the most. Uh, I think that uh, all of these issues are coming together and also in a leadership crisis where in this nation, for the last four years, we have um, experienced a 
of resurgence. Um, as I said before, a reinvigorated racial crisis, a divide, a racial and economic or class divide. I don't think all of this is just happenstance or it just happens that they're all coinciding with one another. I think there is um, there's like a divine like kind of reordering in place. My biggest concern in this moment is that we will center on the public health crisis. Uh, you know, we will try to figure out how to, you know, science our way, thank God, uh, out of, um, out, you know, out of COVID. Uh, we will center on the economic crisis and figure out how we're going to rebuild and rebuild better, if you will, America when it comes to jobs. Uh, and we'll look at policing, uh, you know, because of the, the killings of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Rashad, uh, Rashad Brooks. We'll look at policing and say we need to do some work there. And we will ignore or overlook that what essentially is like the underpinning of all of this is racial injustice. Systemic racism that pervades every pillar of our society, whether it be economic, education, educational, health, um, criminal justice, environmental, Racism, systemic racism pervades every facet, every pillar of our society. And I believe that the collective action required in this moment is that for the first time in America, we all recognize that, embrace that, and seek to do something about it. Um, we saw over the course of the summer, many people taking to the streets to um, call for an end to racialized policing in America, a disproportionate excessive use of force. And that did my heart good, and I'm sure that it, 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 you know, it, it comforted many to see that it was not just Black Americans, but people of all different races and ethnicities standing up and saying, we need to end the killing of Black persons disproportionately at the hands of police officers. But what concerned me in that moment is that we would center only on policing, as though it is in policing only where systemic racism rears its ugly head, and that we will miss the opportunity to look at how racism presents, as I just said, in every facet of our society. So the collective action, as I think about it in this moment, is yes, we've got to get the economy back up and running. And we've got to focus on education and health. But the underlying you know, elephant in the room or the, un, you know, the underpinning is we built a society you know, that is racist in nature, inherently racist now. And we have built classism and capitalism on top of that. And until we address that underlying root cause we're not going. We're not going to value each other, black, white, or other, as human beings. Everybody of equal value, which will then allow for the perpetuation of all of these disparities and these injustices. You have spoken a great truth here. Um, it's something this is not going to go away. This is going to revisit every life, every generation, over and over in uglier and uglier ways because it demands to be solved mm -hmm. and generally these traumas in in society in the country's history are as powerful as the traumas we each carry so yeah. if you tr carry a trauma of abuse that abuse will make itself heard over and over the same for, for any country really um, we are in this country today but unless there is a process of forgiveness acknowledgement forgiveness and reconciliation no no human being no 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 person who is part of society in its tapestry can go forward first you have to acknowledge what is what is true so i will stop speaking i will ask we have many many wonderful questions from our students and we have 25 minutes so these are Wonderfully personal questions. Jennifer, what books are on your bedside table? 
So uh, I am reading Cast right now, and uh, I'm excitedly reading it with a, a group of women, uh, women of different uh, races and ethnicities. So it, it's, it's making the conversation very lively. Uh, it's a book club titled The Uncomfortable Book Club. And so we read White Fragility together. We'll soon be reading some James Baldwin. Uh, we're going to be reading Begin Again by Eddie Glaude, which is an examination of James Baldwin and his work from years past. I need to get a good, just relaxing book. So if anybody's got one, put it in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> now we're all, all reading difficult books and, and sort of confrontational books, right? Because this is the moment to confront things. Who is an exemplar of yours? Could you? You know, it, it's interesting. I um, I will tell you that I I think that because of of my 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 life and my journey and experiences, I've come to appreciate that there is no one person who is perfect in this world, and that we have to be very careful not to idolize people. Uh, but what I do find is that I there are people who inspire me for different reasons. So I'm inspired right now by Kamala Harris, that this is a woman who defied many odds, uh, you know, ra raised by a mother who essentially was a single mother, an immigrant, uh, but, you know, who was raised, even though her mother was Indian and had she'd been abandoned by her father, who was a Jamaican, um, African Jamaican man, uh, African American, African Jamaican man. She, her mother still found a way to help her identify with her, her African, uh, her African roots, and that she found a way to bring the two together, and she's persevered. There are many people, there, there's, there's the, there's the, the gentleman who I've come to know just recently who um, was a dentist, uh, got in trouble with the law, and um, went to uh, federal prison and is now out practicing the, uh, dentistry again. Uh, you know, got his license and is practicing again and is helping other people to re-enter society. Uh, another man who went to uh, prison at 17 and is now senior vice president of a, um, a nonprofit and is working with me to end solitary confinement here in New York City. So I find uh, exemplary things in people and not so much one individual. Indeed. What are you currently working on? What policies are important to your work? Ooh, so uh, two big things that, that are keeping me, uh, waking me up at five o'clock and sitting in the bed at 9, 30, 10 o'clock, I should say, taking me off of Zoom at 9, 30, 10 o'clock. Uh, right now, I'm working with the city of New York uh, in solitary confinement for uh, uh, individuals in New York City jails. Uh, when we do it, we will be the first city in the nation to bring them in to uh, solitary confinement, placing people who detained persons in the cells uh, with no light for th 23 hours a day. Just an in inhumane practice that has been found to uh, greatly debil debilitate people uh, and give them, as you just spoke to Manuel, lifelong trauma. So we're going to end that here in New York, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be a part of it and I'm very hopeful for what it will do in terms of helping individuals. I'm also working um, on policing reform in New York City right now. Uh, there is a mandate to reform policing, to end racial, racialized policing and excessive use of force, and to bring about greater transparency and discipline for uh, police officers when they engage in, uh, with people in ways that they should not. Uh, what I'm excited about there is that we are talking about policing plus, and what I mean by that is um, our society has very often used police officers as the default for other systems that have failed. And so we're looking at transparency, discipline, uh, changes in policies, but we're also looking at working to make sure that police are not the first responders when people suffer with mental illness, that we do not criminalize homelessness. We don't criminalize other manifestations of poverty, but that we work on the services and supports that people need 
so that it's not the police who are called. So that's what I'm doing right now. Very, very important work. Um, it's, a, it's a psychological, psychiatric work as well for society. Um, there is this strange belief, I've always found it personally very strange, that poverty should not exist, or if it does exist, it's something wrong with those people. Right. So as you say, we criminalize those, those people and the whole system comes crashing down in that way. And that has to be addressed, that has to be rebalanced. Right. There's going to be strong people and weak people, always. And especially when we appreciate that so much of our poverty, uh, poverty in America is based on race and ethnicity and classism. Uh, this sense that there are certain people who are entitled and there are others who are not. That's right. It's a pervasive belief. It, it, there's no reason why it's like this. Mm -hmm. No reason at all. But right. We somehow believe it. I agree. Who, who has been your most compelling guest on your show, Open Line? There was a young lady who came on Open Line um, during Mental Health Awareness Month about a year ago. And uh, she, she was so open. She was willing to be vulnerable in talking about the challenges of being young in America at this time. All of the pressures, the pressure to be perfect or as close to perfect as one can possibly be. She talked about the pressure of having the right selfie, of making sure that, you know, when she uh, put a message on Instagram, uh, that, you know, that, that she had the right buzzwords. Uh, and, and, and she talked about how that was causing her sometimes to not even want to get out of the bed and to engage. And, and, and I believe that her vulnerability and her openness helped me to, to see the, the, how do I best say this, the, the less obvious demands that we are putting upon one another. You know, we've always been a society that, um, you know, your, your position, who you, who you are related to, what type of work you do has uh, created a sense of status and in turn can create stigma. Uh, if you're not in the right circles, if you're not in the right family, or you don't do like the, the most, um, you don't do the work that makes the most money. But I hadn't thought about how young persons today are all the more challenged uh, by the images on social media and the need uh, that, 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 that it can create in some, the feeling that they're not keeping up or they're not as good as. Uh, she said, she, t she told me the line, and perhaps some of you have heard it, that behind every um, every every 24 year old selfie are about 37 that just didn't make the cut. <laughs> <laughs> but how that you know that's a stress, and you know and what do you do to break that stress? And she talked about detach, like not disconnecting, but shutting down from time to time, and centering on that which brings you joy and makes you feel good about yourself and turning off social media and turning off other outlets that can create this added pressure. So she was probably for me the most impactful. I mean, she was speaking to me. She was helping me to understand young people in my life. Um, she was probably the most impactful. This is a wonderful example. I think the reflection, who am I, is lifelong, but it's also a, a portal into, into not trying to be like everybody else. Right. right. It's so important that we don't strive to be like everybody else, but just being yourself is, is enough. And that inevitably is rewarded when you are yourself. Positionality is important. You're working in spaces both inside and outside elected office. Where do you see change happening and how do you learn how to maneuver within and outside those systems? So um, I'm smiling because I uh, uh, I have a 23 year old daughter, and uh, about 
a month ago. We were up late uh, one evening as we were talking about her work. Uh, she's in graduate school. And uh, she, she introduced me to two terms that I'd never heard before. Uh, perhaps some of you have, and, and the person who asked the question actually used a word that is part of the terms. She talked about war of position and war of maneuver. And essentially what she taught me is that uh, the war of position is when you try to affect change using a position, very often it's kind of working within the system. So you're trying to affect change in the system, uh, but you may do it from a power of, of a position of power from within. So you want to change um, healthcare in America. So perhaps you go in and you work as a secretary of health for the federal government, or you work as a deputy commissioner or a, a director in health within the city of New York's Department of Health and Dental Hygiene. That's your position. And you try to bring all that you know uh, and all of your experiences to affect the necessary change. War of maneuver is when you operate from the outside. It's more of an activist on the outside, uh, demanding that systems be disrupted, that they be overhauled, and you're seeking to do it by pushing and nudging uh, aggressively from the outside. What I found is that um, I like to operate as best I can from both spaces, and that different issues um, and situations demand that I show up differently. So sometimes, let's say it's um, working with working to increase minimum wage here in New York City and the New York State. Uh, I went and engaged directly with the city of New York when I heard that Mayor de Blasio was talking about the importance of raising the wage, but he had thousands of people on the New York City payroll making less than $15 an hour. I used that knowledge and I used my experience having worked in city government to help uh, bring about change and increase the minimum wage, first here in New York City and then at the state level. Uh, I have, in other instances, operated from that position of war of maneuver to bring about change. So uh, an example for you would be uh, work around uh, poverty and prison involvement. I have tried to use knowledge and work with other entities, uh, poverty fighters and people engaged in criminal justice reform from the outside to push people on the inside. I think that you know there are people who stay in one space or position where they operate from more maneuver. For me, I've tried to do a bit of both. I think Eleanor would have would have applauded that. She, she also worked both, both sides. How has COVID-19 reshaped your work? How are you working and what are you working on? I think in part we know, you've told us, but what's different now? So what COVID-19 has done for me is, we, we, let me first say that uh, the organization that I lead uh, has 170 nonprofit human service agencies who work on the ground on a daily basis. So in, uh, in, in this COVID-19 moment, we've done a lot more to make sure that they have critical uh, services and supports and service offerings. So we've done a lot to bring resources for everything from um, food, uh, to address food insecurity, to uh, financial assistance for people who may be facing uh, eviction. Just using those as two examples. We centered a lot on addressing the immediate needs as they present. In those first days, we were in, uh, working to ensure that the human service workers, the people who are providing childcare, providing home health aid assistance, um, child welfare needs, that they were considered as essential as healthcare workers, because often they're not, but these people are making sure that your grandmother um, or your child is well taken care of in this moment. So we did our best to make sure that they were given the supports that they needed, including PPE equipment. COVID-19 has enhanced our work around fighting for uh, an increase in the social safety net, because we're seeing increasingly that there are people who are going without. It also has deepened my understanding of other systems and where people may go without. So let's take education. I'm now more centered than I ever was on the academic, the, the achievement gap. 
for low-income persons and persons of color. Because even with access uh, to, to, to Chromebooks and iPads and tablets of any type, we know that children who have already been, uh, who already are behind in learning are losing all the more. And so I've been centering more on how do we address the needs that don't necessarily um, show up on a, you know, on a, on, a, on, a, on a list of kids going without iPads, technology. I'm centering a lot more on mental health. The fact that we as a nation, as you spoke to, you know, we all experience some form of trauma and we've all been traumatized by COVID-19. People who are already suffering, uh, you know, like you know, because of poverty, justice involvement, and other issues already suffering are suffering all the more. So we're leaning in and trying to figure out how we can help address the growing mental health challenges. And, you know, I, I find that children are being really little soldiers on the front line because they may feel guilty about going to school and bringing back um, yes. the possibility of other family members being contagious. So sometimes they don't want they, to go to school and at the same time they also need to see their friends so we are asking mm -hmm. six seven year olds to become professional students you know uh, working remotely online and and keeping the whole family safe it's a lot that we're putting on our children and i think we have to be mindful that they are children and that childhood is sacred and they can't play with each other and they can't feel free so that's that's something that we i agree we all have to remember that we we're asking them to to behave like grown-up adults responsible adults how do you help live policy how does policy get translated to folks in the community what does that process look like so one of the things that I fervently believe is that policy needs to begin in the community. Uh, I think that we as a society have for so long felt like we know what is best for community at every turn, especially people who are uh, challenged, uh, you know, economically, uh, you know, people who are impoverished, uh, people who uh, have mental health challenges. Uh, people who've been involved with the justice system. We believe, those of us who have not had those challenges, believe that we know best. And so very often policy has begun at the top and then pushed down. What I believe is that policy making actually needs to begin in the community, that the community's voice needs to be heard, and then they need to help shape, inform, and influence policy. So here's a great example for you. I mentioned a short while ago that I'm engaged in the work of policing reform. Well, one of the things that I am centered on right now is that we cannot move to rewriting uh, policing policy and practice in New York City until we have heard the voices of community. Now, here's an interesting thing. People say, okay, so we're going to sit down and talk with the community about solutions. And what I've responded with is, Yes, we can talk about solutions, but I think first and foremost, we need to hear the experience. Okay. Because when you make policy, but you're not listening to people's lived experience, it's hollow and very often it's shallow and most often it's detrimental. So the way that I like to think of it is that our policy work needs to come from the community. It needs to come from boots on the ground and then be shaped and informed, never leaving community out of the conversation. Right now, we're doing some work to address what we call the benefits cliff here in New York City. It's actually something that is happening around the country. What happens is that you are entitled to income supports based on your income. Well, what often happens in certain places is that your income can go up by a dollar an hour and all of a sudden you're no longer eligible for a childcare subsidy, or you're no longer eligible for um, food supports, for you know, a money that will help you buy groceries. Your income may have just gone up a dollar an hour. And when that's taxed, 
right? Maybe your paycheck at the end of the week, maybe you have another like $20 if in your, in your, in your pocketbook, in your purse, in, on your check. But that, that's your income support. Your food support assistance may go down because you got that additional $35, $35 an hour. It may go down by $75. So we're trying to address that benefits cliff and we're doing it by engaging directly with people with lived experience who can help us shape what the policy should be. That's right. It's, it's sort of siloed systems that do, do not integrate yes. well. You, it's 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 mind-boggling. It is really indeed it is. And 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 how how challenging that it is so mind-boggling for the people struggling with it. I mean, it shouldn't it should be made much easier. Well, no, it, you certainly. shouldn't have to have to have a PhD no. degree in 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 figuring it out. You know, and that's when you begin to think, Manuela, that it's that 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 there it is by design. That there is like you know that that there's kind of puppeteers who are, who who want to make things more complicated than they need be. So we're trying to break through all that. Well, well, it's I think this idea that every individual in society needs to be utterly successful and on on a on a tangent to rise upwards towards um, you know great financial well being, and that's the only meaningful life one can have you know most of us realize that that is there is no wisdom in that vision we have four minutes and four questions okay let's go rapid fire questions. okay we're ramped up how can students get involved with the center for leadership development so um what you can do there are two things that i tell people all the time and i mean this with the utmost sincerity you can visit the FPWA uh, website, www.fpwa.org to learn more about it. But you can also reach out to me. Uh, and my email address is, and we put it up, but you can share it later, jjaustin at fpwa.org. J-J-A-U-S-T-I-N at fpwa.org. And we'll help you. Wonderful, JJ. I love that. <laughs> Thank you so much. That is so extraordinarily generous of you to to offer yourself as a contact. That is so meaningful. We are deeply grateful. We did not, I assure you, we did not ask for this. This is given in utter generosity and from the depths of her heart. Our so, role in life is to help others, right? And that's so, right. absolutely. How do activists get involved with policy action? So it, it, that's a really great, 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 great question. All of these questions are great, but the reason why that's so great is that I literally just had a conversation um, with um, Reverend Al Sharpton about this. And um, he, he explained it so well. He said that what we have to remember is that activists very often are the ones who are agitating. And they are the ones who are like, you know, like kind of banging, you know, banging, banging against the wall and they're ringing the bells, but then the, the policy people have to come in and take the doors that they have opened by their activism, take the paths that have been forged by their activism and turn those paths into policy. So the fact that we're doing policing reform, policing uh, reform by way of policy right now, it's not because policy people came along and said, oh, we think we need to change, you know, like, you know, like we need to look at chokehold bans or we need to look at discipline and transparency. It is because activists said there's something wrong with chokehold bans being permissible. There's something wrong with police officers uh, having discipline, histories of discipline issues, and there being no accountability and there being no transparency in that. So the activists are the ones who get out there and they stir it up, they stir the pot. And then the policy people have to be there to say, okay, now we've got it going, right? We've got it, you know, it's boiling. Let's jump in there and now make something good here. It's a partnership. Yeah, that's, that's a wonderful, wonderful and inspiring way of describing how, you know, a certain restless spirit 
can work with a more, um, you know, uh, sort of patient spirit. And you need both. You need the agitators, and you need the loud voices, and then you need the, the deep work. And both come together. The last question. It seems that we miss the power of working in local government. What do you suggest to students to get involved? I missed the first part, it seems. The power, we miss the power of working in local government. What do you suggest to students to get involved in local government? So the first thing I tell you is that, um, that people sometimes discount the value of getting involved and working in local government. But I will tell you that of all the branches of government, I think that I, uh, I, 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 I have gravitated towards and would continue to gravitate towards local government because that's where the real work of affecting the lives of people occurs. Uh, you know, at the national level, you're setting policy and you're setting law and you're setting direction, but you don't really know the impact of it. Even at the state level, you're doing the same. It's in local government where actual service delivery is happening. Uh, I think that uh, students, at every turn they get, should consider uh, internships in local government, should consider being a part of the Urban Fellows Program. Uh, it's a national program and there are many, many opportunities here in New York City. First jobs uh, out of college and graduate school, avail yourself, if you can, of an opportunity in government. I wanted to be a um, trans, I, I wanted to be an advocate and I wanted to change the way that the world engages with uh, children who are struggling. And the people who were most uh, impactful in my life in my early years said, before you get out there and you stand and you, with, a, with a protest, you know, like a, 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 a stick in your hand, go work in government. See how government functions. Understand why it does what it does, and it'll make you all the more effective. And that's what I did. Never regret it. That's a wonderful, wonderful suggestion. And, and Eleanor Roosevelt herself, she, she said, where do human rights begin? And they begin close to home, right here. Places so small, you could not find them on a map. In fact, they began here in Hyde Park, a tiny, tiny little town nobody hardly ever knows. And this is where it all began. So I think, thank you so Thank you so, so much for being with us for this hour. Um, we've answered all the questions from students and it, it's wonderful to hear you. It's wonderful to get to know you and um, we are so inspired. So My absolute honor and pleasure, a gift this morning. You have thank started you. our cycle of Thanksgiving and we thank you. On the thank, you. thank you so much. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye everyone. Thank you. Until next time.